Last time, Seleucus IV Philopator had been murdered by his chief minister Heliodorus, who quickly assumed the regency for the king's youngest son, Antiochus. Antiochus, a boy of just five, was crowned, and coins were minted in his youthful image, but he was king in name only, with Heliodorus holding the supreme authority. Tellingly, no effort was made to summon Demetrius, the eldest son of Seleucus IV and true heir to the throne, from Rome back to Syria to receive his rightful inheritance. Heliodorus desired to keep control over the empire for as long as he could, and for this purpose a younger king, far from the age of manhood, was more practical. There was only one other close male member of the Seleucid dynasty who remained to contest the throne, Antiochus, the brother of Seleucus IV, an uncle of Demetrius and the younger Antiochus. The prince had spent about a decade living as a hostage in Rome, where he had grown an appreciation for Roman traditions and customs, as well as having made personal friendships with the young men of the Roman aristocracy. Following his release, rather than returning to Syria to play second fiddle to his brother, Antiochus resided in Athens. There he was awarded honorary citizenship. Among historians, it was long held that on the basis of coinage bearing the name Antiochus, as well as the image of an elephant, that the prince had served as Archon of the city, but the evidence for that claim has been largely dismissed as mere coincidence. Nevertheless, Antiochus would never forget his time in Athens. It was while he was an Athenian citizen that the news came to him of the palace coup in Syria and of the murder of his brother. Antiochus did not hesitate, but immediately set to work to depose the usurping vizier, collaborating with the most unlikely of allies, King Eumenes II of Pergamon. The Italid dynasty of Pergamon and the Seleucids had been regular enemies since the defeat and death of Antiochus I Sota nearly a century earlier. However, during the reign of Seleucus IV, Pergamon had been diplomatically encircled by an alliance of states, including the Seleucid Empire, rendering it extremely vulnerable and entirely dependent on Roman support in the event of war. If Eumenes could put an ally on the Seleucid throne, then suddenly his geopolitical position would become far less treacherous. To this end, Antiochus was summoned to Pergamon, where he and Eumenes concluded a treaty of alliance. Thereafter, a crown was made up for Antiochus, and a fully supplied Pergamene force was put at his disposal. Sacrifices to the gods were made for good fortune, and then Eumenes and his brothers escorted the Seleucid prince east to the border of their two realms. The details of what followed are lost to us, with the only possible clue coming from the Book of Daniel, where Antiochus's methods are described as being underhanded. Presumably Heliodorus must have made preparations for such an invasion, whether from Antiochus or from Demetrius, but at the same time there must have been significant internal opposition against the usurper. In any case, by November of 175 BC, only two months after the assassination of Seleucus IV, Antiochus had seized Antioch and Heliodorus had been put to death, his brief reign coming to an ignominious end. The puppet king Antiochus was kept alive for the time being, with both Antiochoi officially reigning as co-kings, but it was obvious to all who the real ruler was, with the senior king being the one known to us as Antiochus IV. While the usurpation of Heliodorus had been illegitimate, the coronation of Antiochus IV was itself hardly more legitimate. He had no claim to the throne while the sons of Seleucus IV still lived. Therefore, Antiochus sought to create the appearance of legitimacy and of continuity of rule from his deceased brother to himself. As such, the king married the queen dowager Laodice, his own sister, meaning that she had now been married to each of her three brothers in turn. As part of this marriage, Antiochus formally adopted his nephew and co-regent as his son. This was clearly a piece of political theatre, as Antiochus IV had no intention of allowing his nephew to ever rule in his own right. Next came a political reshuffling of the officials of the realm. Apollonius of Tarsus, who had been the governor of Kole, Syria, and a close advisor of Seleucus, was exiled to Miletus. Hyrcanus, a Jew who had established for himself a petty kingdom in Seleucid territory to the east of the Jordan, which had been tolerated by Seleucus, 
committed suicide shortly after the accession of Antiochus. Two brothers who were close friends of the king were appointed to high office, with Heraclides given charge of the exchequer, and with Timarchos being appointed as satrap of Media and Babylon. Presumably other immediate changes were also affected, but the full details have not survived. In 174 BC, an embassy from Rome arrived at Antioch to establish diplomatic relations with the new king, which was warmly welcomed by the Romanophile ruler, who was likely personally familiar with the Roman commissioners from his time being a hostage. A reciprocal Seleucid embassy was sent to Rome in the following year, led by Apollonius, son of Menestheus. The Syrian official apologized that the war indemnity, which had been imposed by the Peace of Apamea, had not been paid in full, but then presented to the Senate the whole of the outstanding balance, as well as a set of gold vases weighing 500 pounds as a gift to the city. Apollonius then conveyed a message from the king, thanking the younger men of the Senate for the genial treatment he had received during his time as a hostage, and promising that he would ever be at the service of Rome. His request was merely a renewal of the treaty of friendship which had existed between his father and the Republic. The urban praetor, Aulus Attilius Serranus, was ordered to renew this alliance, and Apollonius was awarded a gift of a hundred thousand assays. In addition, he was bestowed quarters for the duration of his stay in Italy at public expense. This alliance served the interests of both sides. For Antiochus, maintaining positive relations with what was now the undisputedly preeminent power of the Mediterranean world was vital to avoid any further subdivision of his kingdom as his father had suffered. For the Romans, they were making preparations for the coming war with Perseus of Macedon, whose anti-Roman policy was, by now, plain to see. Keeping the Seleucid Empire out of this war would deprive Macedon of a valuable ally, while the presented tribute, whether or not it did in actuality make up the precise required total of the war indemnity, would provide a healthy boost to the military budget. In 172 BC, another Roman embassy toured the Eastern Mediterranean in order to evaluate the loyalty of the various Roman allied states. This included a stop in Antioch, which resulted in a positive report back to the Senate. However, Antiochus had begun to quietly breach the conditions of the Peace of Apamea, constructing new warships in Phoenicia and re-establishing the War Elephant Corps. It was at around this time that Queen Laodice gave birth to a son, who was creatively named Antiochus. After a couple of years had passed, once it was clear the boy would live, Antiochus IV had no more need of his stepson Antiochus. On the king's orders, a man named Andronicus murdered the boy king, and shortly after this Andronicus himself was murdered, perhaps as part of a cover-up. Now Antiochus IV was able to rule alone, although the rightful heir in Demetrius remained in Rome, beyond the reach of his uncle. Laodice may well have died at around this time, perhaps in childbirth after producing a daughter also named Laodice, as she is not attested after 170 BC. Antiochus never remarried, but he did take concubines, who may have produced further children, although this is a matter of long debate. One such concubine was named Antiochus, who, based on her name, could have been another relation of the king. In 171 BC, she was granted authority over the cities of Tarsus and Malus as a gift. The peoples there did not accept her rule and revolted, leading to Antiochus marching to Calicia to suppress the uprising. It so happened that the region had for some time been ravaged by bandits hiding out in the Taurus Mountains. So while he was there, the king took this opportunity to root them out. The local populace was grateful for this, and erected a statue of Antiochus taming a bull. We might break from the narrative for a moment to discuss the general character of Antiochus IV, as the ancient authors recorded some anecdotes on the topic. The king was an admirer of Roman culture and instituted public political offices on a Roman model in Antioch. At election times, he would don a simple white toga and would wander the agora, asking people for their votes. Upon successful election, he would fulfill his duties with zeal. Seated upon his curule chair, he eagerly listened to arguments and judged liability in ordinary contract disputes. At great cost, he imported gladiators from Rome, whose performances initially frightened the Greek citizens, unused as they were to such displays. 
but soon they came to be widely enjoyed, particularly among the young men. The king would bathe in the public baths, as though he were an ordinary citizen, although he would cover himself in rich perfumes. At one time, a fellow bather commented on how expensive Antiochus smelt. When this man next attended the baths, the king had two large jugs of the valuable perfume dumped on his head. Naturally, the unguent went everywhere, and so the poor people at the baths scrambled to gather it up. The king himself slipped in the commotion and fell, which prompted him to burst out laughing, shortly being joined by the bathers around him. When meeting with the great men of the realm, Antiochus would only give them small and childish gifts, such as cakes, dates, knuckle bones, and toys. However, upon meeting total strangers in the street, he would greet them warmly and spontaneously award them life-changing amounts of wealth. At times, he would stand about in the street, throwing gold in the air for any who wanted it. At other times, he would give his bodyguards the slip, and would eventually be found in the workshops of goldsmiths, where he would be having long technical discussions with the craftsmen there. He often patrolled the city in a fine gold robe, with a garland of roses, and would throw stones at any of his companions who tried to follow him. The king, like his father, was a famous lover of drink, and had a fountain at Antioch filled with wine. He regularly could be found in the grimiest inns of the city, carousing with the meanest of characters. If Antiochus ever heard that young men were holding a banquet, he would gather drummers and fife players, and then burst into the party unannounced which would often cause the revelers to flee in terror. For all of this behavior, many called him a fool. Some even called him mad, but historians such as Livy admitted admiration of his kingly spirit. Antiochus even went so far as to refer to himself with divine terminology, adopting the name Theos Epiphanes, meaning the God made manifest. Although Polybius says that people mockingly called him Epimanes, the Madman. Returning to the narrative of events, in Egypt, Cleopatra Syra had reigned as queen regent on behalf of her boy's son, Ptolemy VI Philometor. Her late husband had planned a campaign against the Seleucid Empire, but she, as the sister of Antiochus IV, had shown no inclination to fulfill his plans. However, Cleopatra had died at some point in the mid-170s. Due to a general lack of evidence, the precise date of her death remains unclear, with some scholars placing it as early as 178 BC, while others place it as late as 173 BC. Given that no attempt was made by Egypt to capitalize upon the instability within the Seleucid Empire following the murder of Seleucus IV, the latter date appears slightly more plausible. In any case, her death coming during her late 20s or early 30s does raise some suspicion that she may have been assassinated by the pro-war party, but again, there is no surviving evidence for the circumstances of her death. It was though that very pro-war party which seized control of the Egyptian regency with a eunuch named Eulaeus and a former Syrian slave named Lenaeus taking guardianship of Ptolemy VI and slowly but surely, they drew their plans against the Seleucids. The premature death of his sister would have caused Antiochus some degree of alarm, and this was only heightened after a festival in Alexandria, sometime between 174 and 172 BC. This festival may have been in relation to the Anacleteria, the traditional coming-of-age ceremony for the Ptolemaic monarchs. Apollonius, son of Menestheus, was in attendance, once again serving in an ambassadorial function on behalf of the Seleucid state. He received a hostile reception and reported back to Antiochus that the Egyptians were making preparations for war, with their casus belli being a fabricated agreement between Antiochus III and Ptolemy V to hand over Kole Syria as a dowry for Cleopatra Syra. The king immediately dispatched an envoy to Rome, led by one of his subordinates, Malaga, in order to apprise the Senate on the deteriorating situation. However, Rome's attention was, for the time, fixated on Macedon, so no military intervention in the east was to be expected. Antiochus then mustered an army and marched south to Jaffa in order to keep a watch on the border with Egypt. The attack did not come immediately, so at the end of the campaigning season, Antiochus returned north to Phoenicia.
In 171 BC, Perseus of Macedon invaded Thessaly, beginning the Third Macedonian War. This meant that Rome was now totally distracted with events there, and that, for now at least, both Egypt and Syria were free to do as they like without outside interference. In late 170 BC, Eulaeus and Linnaeus gathered the citizens of Alexandria and boasted to them of the great victory which they were about to accomplish, that they would quickly win not only Kole Syria back, but seize the whole of the Seleucid realm. They showed off vast amounts of gold, silver, jewels, and other treasures gathered from the royal palaces. These, they claimed, would ensure the speedy surrender of all fortresses and cities to their forces. For these two regents had no experience whatsoever in military matters, so it was in bribery which they placed their faith, assuming that all men were just as greedy as they were. Whether due to arrogance or to plain foolishness, these preparations for the invasion of Syria were made with no subtlety whatsoever, and so Antiochus would be well prepared for their arrival. In November of 170 BC, the Egyptian army crossed the border, where the Seleucids were waiting for them, and they met in battle somewhere to the east of Pelusium. In this battle, the difference between amateurs playing at war and military professionals was shown, with the Ptolemaic army being utterly defeated. Antiochus took mercy on his enemies and ordered his soldiers to take the Egyptians alive, who were likely resettled within the empire. In Rome, ambassadors from both the Seleucid and Ptolemaic courts had arrived, with the lead Seleucid ambassador, Malaga, protesting the invasion, while the Ptolemaic ambassadors argued that Kole Syria was rightfully part of Egypt. The Senate agreed to write to Ptolemy on the matter, but nothing more was promised. The Seleucid army now went on the offensive, marching on Pelusium itself, which served as the gateway to Egypt proper. Precisely what happened next is unclear, but Polybius criticised Antiochus for gaining control of the city through a cunning ruse. In any case, the gates of Egypt were now wide open, and Antiochus advanced into the Black Land proper, becoming the first man to successfully do so since Alexander the Great. Meanwhile, at sea, the Seleucid navy routed the Egyptians off the coast of Pelusium. Eulaeus and Linnaeus, having fled, remained holed up in Alexandria, providing no opposition, while Antiochus occupied everything south of the Nile Delta. Fearing an attack on the capital, Eulaeus had placed Ptolemy VI on a ship bound for Samothrace, but the vessel was intercepted by the Seleucid navy, whereupon the boy king fell into the hands of Antiochus. The Seleucid monarch had now gained a powerful asset, as with the pharaoh in his power, an Egyptian client state could be established with genuine claims to legitimacy. The wholesale annexation of Egypt would hardly have been tolerated by the Romans, so creating a vassal which was formally independent, but which was reliant on the Seleucid throne, would be a far more practical plan. The captured Ptolemy was thus compelled to sign a peace treaty with Antiochus, after which he was spirited to the ancient capital of Memphis, where a puppet government was established. Antiochus now styled his war as a righteous one, championing the primogenitor rights of his nephew against a usurpation by his siblings and their overbearing regents. In Alexandria, however, the army had had enough of the ranking competence of Eulaeus and Linnaeus, who were overthrown in a coup and replaced by a military council headed by two officers Romanus and Cineus. They elevated the younger brother of the absent Ptolemy VI Philometor to the throne, who styled himself as Ptolemy Euergetes after his great-grandfather, although the people of Alexandria nicknamed him Physcon on account of his obesity. The Regency Council did recognize the desperation of their situation and made an attempt to negotiate a peace with Antiochus. Neutral ambassadors, hailing from Athens, Achaea, and Miletus, were sent from Alexandria to treat with the Seleucid king. Antiochus welcomed them warmly, and listened to their arguments. The envoys placed the blame for the whole war on Eulaeus, and begged mercy for the Ptolemies because of their shared blood. The king responded by arguing that the Ptolemies had wrongfully occupied Kole Syria for a century, after it had been assigned to Seleucus Nicator following the Battle of Ipsus, and that the Egyptian claim of an agreement to hand over the province was a forgery. 
Antiochus went on in this manner and ended up convincing the ambassadors of the righteousness of his claim. The negotiations having come to naught, the Seleucid army then advanced towards Alexandria, coming to the town of Nacratis, where each of the Greek citizens there was awarded a gold stator for their trouble. It is worth noting that Antiochus had minted his own coins using Egyptian designs, featuring eagles for just such an occasion. Now, in early 169 BC, an embassy from the new regions had arrived in Rome. The ambassadors put on an histrionic display, with their hair ungroomed and their beards unshaven, garbed all in black and one brandished an olive branch. They prostrated themselves before the Senate and begged that the Romans beseech Antiochus to cease his war against Egypt, or soon it would be Ptolemy Eugates and his sister Cleopatra II who would be before them as refugees. This performance served its function, and the senators were moved, who then dispatched a commissioner, Titus Numisius, to Alexandria in order to negotiate a truce. Alexandria, the great commercial, cultural, and scientific center of the Mediterranean, now found itself under a Seleucid siege, to the shock of the rest of the Greek world. The Rhodian delegation arrived at the Seleucid camp to once again attempt to broker peace with Antiochus. Praxon, the lead ambassador, spoke at some length about the friendly relations his people had with both the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and then began to talk about the important familial ties between the two dynasties. Antiochus interrupted him to point out that King Ptolemy was a friend, and that they had already signed a treaty of peace and alliance with each other. All that the Seleucid army was doing was aiding the rightful king in retaking his kingdom from a usurper. Following this, Antiochus launched a probing assault on the city, but his forces were repulsed. The details of this defense are not known to us, but for the king it seems not to have been any sort of serious setback. Titus Numisius arrived to negotiate with Antiochus, but he too was largely ineffective. In any case, however, to Antiochus it was clear that Alexandria would not be an easy prize to take, and that the eyes of Rome were watching him, even if their military was for now busied with Macedon. Moreover, Antiochus had been away from his own kingdom for the better part of a year. So the siege of Alexandria was lifted, and Seleucid forces withdrew from Egypt, leaving only a garrison holding the gateway that was Pelusium, while Ptolemy VI Philometor was left in charge at Memphis, so that he could fight a civil war against his brother and sister in Alexandria. Antiochus did not leave empty-handed though, but hauled away much of the vast accumulated wealth of the Ptolemaic kingdom making the state coffers, which had been all but emptied under his father, now overflowing with more gold than ever before. The king then dispatched a reciprocal embassy to Rome in order to smooth over relations, with a gift of 50 talents being presented to the Senate. Polyanus also reports that Antiochus donated elephants for use by the Roman army against Macedon, but this seems doubtful given that the continued existence of the Seleucid Elephant Corps was itself a contravention of the Peace of Apamea, and in this delicate situation, it would have been wise not to draw attention to this infringement. At about this time, Perseus sent an envoy to Antiochus in an attempt to induce him to join the war against Rome, or failing that to mediate a peace, but this request was ignored. The Seleucid king had a more pressing issue to attend to. While on his way out of Egypt, word came that the city of Jerusalem had revolted against his rule. The Jews and the Seleucids had thus far had something of a tumultuous relationship. Antiochus III had been seen as a liberator from the hated Ptolemies, and had granted Jerusalem many boons. Under Seleucus IV, however, an attempt had been made to seize the wealth of the temple by force, so by the accession of Antiochus IV, popular opinion within Jerusalem was very much divided. Since the conquests of Alexander the Great, Hellenic culture had been spread across the breadth of the former Achaemenid Empire. This was spread not only by the creation of new Greek settlements, but also by the voluntary adoption of Hellenic culture by the pre-existing populations of these lands. This was also true of the Jewish people, a significant number of whom became proponents of Hellenic culture, establishing Greek-inspired institutions and adopting Greek names. In 174 BC, Antiochus IV had been approached by a group of these so-called Hellenizing Jews, 
led by a man who had adopted the name of Jason, although his birth name had been Yeshua. He was the brother of the incumbent high priest, Onias III, who was, in contrast, a traditionalist. This group offered tribute to Antiochus and petitioned him to allow their faction to be enrolled as citizens of Antioch, to establish a gymnasium in Jerusalem, and that Jason be appointed as high priest. The king, seeing an opportunity to further culturally integrate the Jewish people into the empire, gave his assent to these requests. Thereafter, Jason began promoting Hellenic culture in Jerusalem, while the deposed Onias III was forced to flee the city. This policy certainly had strident opponents within Jerusalem, but under Jason's rule, the city did see a few years of peace. And around 172 BC, when Antiochus passed through the city on his way to Jaffa, the king was welcomed with a grand torch-lit procession. In 171 BC, Jason sent a certain Menelaus, who was the brother of Simon the Benjamite, who had been official of the temple during the reign of Seleucus IV, to deliver tribute and financial records to Antioch. Menelaus was an even more zealous advocate of Hellenism than Jason, and while in Antioch, through the use of gold misappropriated from the temple, managed to convince Antiochus that he should be appointed as high priest, promising to provide even greater tribute in future. To the king, an increase in taxation, as well as an acceleration of Hellenization, sounded like an ideal situation. Unlike Jason and Ananias, Menelaus had no claim by blood to the priesthood, given he was a Benjamite and was not of the line of Aaron. The intricacies of such things and their importance within Jewish society would not have been clear to the Seleucid court, who would have viewed the appointment of the high priest as being no different to the appointment of any other governor in the empire. Menelaus returned to Jerusalem to take charge, with Jason now being the one forced to flee for his life. However, after some time, Menelaus had yet to pay his promised tribute to the crown, and so a tax official named Sostratus began to hound the high priest. Menelaus relented, stole more gold vessels from the temple, and the two men went to Antioch to pay what was owed. In the meantime, Menelaus' brother, Lysimachus, was left in control of Jerusalem. When Menelaus arrived in Antioch, the king was absent, away dealing with revolt in Calicia, and so the vessels from the temple were presented to one Andronicus, who was temporarily in charge of the city. Onias, who was in exile in nearby Daphne, attempted to expose Menelaus for his thievery, but was treacherously murdered by Andronicus. Upon the king's return, the Jewish population in Antioch petitioned him in protest over the deceitful murder of Onias. Antiochus was moved to tears by their tale, and had Andronicus marched naked through the streets and then publicly executed. Menelaus, however, escaped punishment. Back in Jerusalem, the people had learnt of the plunder of their temple by Menelaus, which finally caused the factions of the city to break into open violence, resulting in the deaths of many. Lysimachus gathered some armed men and attempted to enforce his authority, but he was beaten to death by a mob. While Antiochus was in Tyre, on his way towards Egypt, this issue was brought before him, and Menelaus was put on trial. However, the cunning Benjamite had bribed one of the royal companions, Ptolemaeus, son of Dorimenes, to sway the king to his side. Thus, Menelaus was acquitted, and those who accused him were put to death. In 169 BC, while Antiochus was fighting in Egypt, a rumour spread in Judea that the king had been killed in battle. Believing this, Jason, who had been in exile east of the River Jordan, raised 1,000 men and marched on Jerusalem. The forces of Menelaus were routed, with the high priest being forced to take refuge in the citadel, while Jason, who now controlled the rest of the city, slaughtered all who opposed him. As we know, Antiochus was not dead, but was now on his way back home from Egypt. When the king was informed of the conflict in Jerusalem, the deposition of his appointed governor, and the killings of his supporters, it very much looked like the city was in wholesale revolt against Seleucid rule. Thus Antiochus and his army fell upon Jerusalem. The city was taken with little resistance, as a Hellenizing Jew opened a gate and allowed the Seleucid soldiers to enter. Jerusalem was certainly treated as though it had revolted against the Seleucid state. Little mercy was shown, with many people being executed, while others were made into slaves. Antiochus personally entered the Holy of Holies within the temple 
which was then otherwise desecrated by the sacrifice of swine on the altar, which the priests were forced to consume, an act which is considered anathema within the Jewish faith. The treasury of the temple was seized, as well as its sacred vessels made of gold, amounting to 1,800 talents worth. Menelaus was reaffirmed as high priest, while Jason once again fled the city and would die unmourned in far-off exile. A new citadel was raised in the city of David, known as the Acre, which was garrisoned with Seleucid troops. His business in Judea having been concluded for now, Antiochus finally returned to Syria. In Egypt, some degree of fighting between Ptolemy Philometor and his siblings had taken place following the exodus of the Seleucid army, but this period of civil conflict did not last for long. It is clear that Ptolemy did not trust his supposed friend in Antiochus, and both sides must have been concerned about the revival of the native insurrection against Ptolemaic rule. So by late 169 BC, the two factions came to terms and agreed to rule Egypt together as a triumvirate. Of course, to Antiochus, this represented a violation of the treaty which Ptolemy Philometor had made with him. It is likely that Ptolemy personally would have considered such a treaty, signed under duress, as invalid. In this case, popular opinion would have favoured Ptolemy's position. As now that Antiochus was no longer either fighting for his nephew's rights, nor fending off an invasion, continued conflict would appear as naked Seleucid aggression. Pragmatically, the new unified government still made preparations for another invasion, beseeching the Achaean League to send soldiers to no avail. In the spring of 168 BC, Antiochus began his new campaign against Egypt. His first target was the island of Cyprus, which, given its location, could be used as a springboard to attack Syria. Once the Seleucid fleet arrived at the main port of Salamis, they encountered no resistance as the governor, Ptolemaeus Macron, willingly betrayed his liege lords and surrendered control of the entire island. Meanwhile, Antiochus led the royal army south towards Egypt. Upon reaching Rhinocolura, not far from Pelusium, Antiochus was met by ambassadors from Ptolemy Philometor, who thanked the Seleucid monarch for restoring him his ancestral crown, and asking by what terms peace and friendship could be re-established. The terms given were straightforward, if severe. The formal acknowledgement of Seleucid rule over Cyprus and the region around Pelusium. If this was accepted, it would leave Egypt nearly unable to defend itself in the event of an invasion, and thus permanently at the mercy of the Seleucids. Antiochus gave the Ptolemies time to consider his offer, but once a set date had elapsed without response, the Seleucid army again moved into Egypt proper. Upper Egypt quickly fell back under Seleucid control, with little to no resistance being offered. It was at about this time the armies of Rome and Macedon met at Pydna. Rome utterly crushed the Antigonids once and for all, with Perseus surrendering himself soon after the battle. In a short time the Kingdom of Macedon would be finally abolished, and would be carved up into a series of Roman puppet republics. Relevantly for the Seleucids, this meant that Rome was no longer distracted with affairs in Greece, and was once more in a position to exert military force in Asia. In July, the Seleucid army was approaching Alexandria, having crossed the river at Eleusis, some four miles east from the city. Here, a group of Roman ambassadors, led by the ex-consul Caius Popilius Laenus, who knew Antiochus from his time in Rome, approached the Seleucid camp. Antiochus, upon seeing him, cheerfully shouted a greeting, and once the Roman had come closer, the king outstretched his right hand. Rather than take it, however, Papilius maintained a dour countenance, and placed into the king's hand a tablet containing an ultimatum from the Senate, demanding that the war against the Ptolemies immediately cease. Antiochus read this decree, and then told the Roman that he would consult the royal council on the matter. Papilius was unwilling to brook any delay, and with his vinewood staff, drew out a line in the sand around the king, ordering him not to leave this circle until he had an answer for the senate. Antiochus was taken aback with the haughty and forceful nature of this action, and after a moment of thinking, he responded that he would agree to do whatever the senate thought was right. Suddenly, 
the demeanor of Popilius changed. A smile graced his face, and the two men shook hands and then embraced each other like the old friends they were. By an appointed date, the Seleucid army evacuated from Egypt entirely. Popilius and the other Roman commissioners first went back to Alexandria, where they organized affairs between the two Ptolemies and Cleopatra, before proceeding on to Cyprus, where they peacefully expelled the Seleucid navy and reinstated Ptolemaic rule. Finally, the Romans returned to the Eternal City. An envoy from Antiochus soon arrived, who assured the Senate of the king's loyalty to Rome and congratulated them on their victory over Perseus. In response, the Senate praised Antiochus on behalf of all Rome for following their directions. Next entered the Egyptian ambassadors, who expressed their indebtedness to Rome for saving them from siege and total conquest, promising to always view Rome as their trustworthy protector. The Sixth Syrian War had now come to an end. In simple terms of territorial gains, neither side had accomplished anything. The Egyptians had not come close to their original aim of recapturing Kole Syria, while Antiochus had been unable to keep Pelusium and Cyprus. However, in every other sense, Antiochus had come up trumps. An openly anti-Seleucid regime had been replaced and a binding peace treaty now existed with the Ptolemaic pharaohs, leaving the southern border secure. Importantly, much of the vast accumulated wealth of Egypt had been plundered and taken back to Syria, finally ending the Seleucid cash flow crisis. Vitally, this had been done all while avoiding Roman military intervention and while ultimately maintaining positive relations with the Senate. Antiochus certainly considered the war to have been a success as he extended his regnal name by adding another divine epithet, Nikephoros, the bringer of victory. In 167 BC, the Romans celebrated their victory over Macedon by hosting an impressive set of games at Amphipolis, to which representatives from all across the Greek world were invited. The greatest athletes of the age competed against each other, thrilling races were run by the most famous horses, and the finest artists performed their crafts. Antiochus, with his love for flamboyance, was rather envious of this display and sought to outdo the Romans. After all, he now had enough gold to do so. Games were organized at the sacred grove of Daphne, with envoys traveling across the eastern Mediterranean to invite great multitudes of guests. The festival was opened with a grand military parade, the procession being led by Antiochus himself, mounted on a white horse. Some 50,000 soldiers were assembled for this march, with a unit of 5,000 young men armed and armoured as Roman legionaries heading the display, while an exhibition of the Elephant Corps closed out the military section of the parade. The king rode back and forth on his horse, shouting commands and ordering manoeuvres. Polybius talks of this behaviour as being below the repute of a monarch, but this sort of hands-on display certainly fits the archetype of a Hellenistic king. Once the army had retired, they were followed by a civilian display, being a vast demonstration of wealth. Gold and silver, ivory tusks, fattened cows, and even women scattering rich perfume onto the surrounding throngs. There was also a religious element to this procession, with innumerable images of the gods and of heroes from across the world being processed in front of the crowds. The power and wealth of the Seleucid Empire was made clear to all. After the festival had been opened, there were 30 continuous days of beast fighting and gladiatorial games. Fine oils and perfumes were made freely available to all in the gymnasia, composed of such rare things as saffron and cinnamon. Vast public feasts were held, with some having as many as 1500 places laid out with the most exquisite foods. Antiochus also took a central role in these proceedings, welcoming guests in, moving from couch to couch to make conversation with as many as he could, accepting toasts from all and sundry. Toward the end of one such feast, the mummers carried in a figure wrapped in cloth, so none could tell who he was. Then the band began to play, and the figure leapt out of his wrappings, exposing to all an entirely nude Antiochus. Who began to dance 
and join the actors in their performances, to the shock of the assembled revelers, and again, to the disapproval of the historians. Shortly after the conclusion of the festivities, a Roman embassy arrived, headed by the Tiberius Gracchus, who had served under the Scipiones in the war against Antiochus the Great. He had been sent to assess whether the Seleucid Empire, after such a grand display, once again posed a threat to Rome. Antiochus was wise to this, and put on his finest diplomatic display, utterly charming the Roman ambassadors with his geniality. So glowing was the later report to the Senate that any who suspected ill of Antiochus were utterly discredited. The festival at Daphne was far from the only project which the king undertook using his newly acquired fortune. A vast new quarter was constructed on the slopes of Mount Sipilus, above Antioch, which was named Epiphania in his own honour. Central to this new district was an immense temple dedicated to Jupiter Capitolinus, the ceiling of which was overlaid with gold, while the walls were coated in gold leaf. Inside stood a great statue dedicated to victory, which was made of solid gold. A senate house was also erected in the Epiphania to serve as the centre of the city government. These two structures show the influence which the institutions of Rome had had upon Antiochus. A four and a half metre tall effigy called the Coronian was carved into the limestone of Sipilus, overlooking the city, which, according to Malalus, served as a talisman to ward off plague. The carving can still be seen today, although the details of it have long since worn away, to the point that nobody is really sure who it depicted. For his adoptive home, Athens, Antiochus restarted the construction of the Temple of the Olympian Zeus. The foundations for the colossal temple had been laid under the tyrant Pisistratus, but following his death, construction was halted, and it had famously remained unfinished for more than three centuries. Antiochus hired an esteemed Roman architect, Cassutius, to draw up new plans for the temple, which was to be appropriate in proportion to the majesty of the god which it honoured. To the island of Delos, renowned as the sacred birthplace of his ancestor Apollo, Antiochus had splendid altars and statues commissioned. A fine new temple to Apollo was also erected at Daphne. However, increasingly Antiochus focused less on the identification of his dynasty with Apollo, but rather became fixated upon Zeus, as had Alexander before him. As such, the image of Zeus was returned to Seleucid coinage for the first time in over a century. It was under Antiochus that the system of Seleucid mints was significantly expanded, with cities being permitted to establish local mints in order to produce small denomination copper and bronze coinage. The production of higher value silver coinage was also enlarged, although not to as great a degree. This increased numismatic activity was mostly confined to Syria, Cilicia, and Phoenicia. The eastern provinces seem not to have been affected by the same economic boom. With the western and southern borders now made secure, Antiochus could turn his attention on the oft-forgotten east of the empire. Meanwhile, to the south, in Judea, the situation there had gone from bad to worse. It is worth noting that the sources for the following account are often unclear and sometimes contradictory, so the events have been reconstructed as best possible, but are by no means the only acceptable interpretation. In 168 BC, under the auspices of Menelaus, with the support of a freshly arrived garrison of Seleucid soldiers in the Acra Fortress, a far more severe program of Hellenization was instituted. To this end, the Jewish religion was suppressed, which was the primary distinguisher of a distinct Jewish identity, and thus the chief enemy of Hellenization. In the temple, an altar to Zeus Olympios was erected, who, in the Greek worldview, was identified as being analogous to the God of Israel. This is referred to in the Book of Daniel as the Abomination of Desolation. Similarly, at the request of a Hellenizing faction within the Samaritans, the temple at Mount Gerizim was converted to the worship of Zeus Xenios. Sacrifices of swine were made at these altars, and at altars erected across Judea, with the Jewish population being forced to partake of the impure meat, with those who refused being executed. The observance of the Sabbath and of the other holy days was forbidden, as was the practice of circumcision, 
Wherever they were found, scrolls and books of the Torah were destroyed and their keepers perished with them. Many who refused to follow these new laws were killed or tortured in the following days. Antiochus, while not being the initiator of these new regulations, was broadly aware of what was occurring in Judea and took no particular umbrage with it. The Seleucids had always ruled in a very hands-off manner when it came to local cultures and traditions, which was natural given the vast diversity of the empire. In the eyes of the court in Antioch, the affairs in Judea were an internal Jewish matter, being handled by the local Jewish governor, and for now there was no thought to interfere. This state of affairs naturally began to push those observant and pious Jews into rebellion against the Seleucid state. In the town of Modane, to the west of Jerusalem, there dwelt one Mattathias, with his five sons, John, Simon, Judas, Eleazar, and Jonathan. Seleucid soldiers came to the village in order to enforce the laws of Menelaus. Mattathias, as a priest and a respected member of the community, was first called upon to partake in a sacrifice to Zeus, but he refused. When another Jew willingly made to offer the sacrifice, Mattathias, filled with zealous rage, slew him upon the altar, as well as a Seleucid officer, Apelles. The priest and his sons then fled the town into the hills, along with many of the townsfolk, with more people coming across the land to join them every day. A force of soldiers was dispatched from the Acre in Jerusalem in order to track down the rebels. Upon finding a large group hiding in some caves, the Seleucid commander offered them the opportunity to simply make the required sacrifices and then go free. The Jewish rebels rebuffed this offer, and so on the next Sabbath, the soldiers attacked. Being unwilling to fight on the holy day of rest, a full thousand Hebrews were slaughtered. Following this, Mattathias and his followers resolved they must break the law of Moses in order to defend it, for if they did not fight on the Sabbath, they would quickly be wiped out. The rebel forces of Mattathias continued to swell and they began to launch lightning raids on pagan temples, overturning their altars and driving out Seleucid troops wherever they found them. A year after beginning his revolt, Mattathias, far from being a young man, grew ill and died. On his deathbed, he anointed his third son, Judas Maccabeus, as commander of the army. The rebels would then become known as the Maccabees, after their general. By this point, the situation was getting out of hand, and so a certain Apollonius, possibly Apollonius son of Menestheus, who was then an official in the region, gathered a force of Greeks from Samaria and set out to put down the rebellion. The Maccabees met them in battle and achieved a great victory, with Judas taking the sword of the deceased Apollonius as his personal weapon. This defeat escalated the issue up the chain of command to Seron, the governor of Kole, Syria. He assembled a new army, composed in part of Hellenizing Jews, which met the Maccabees at the towns of Beth Haran, northwest of Jerusalem. Despite being outnumbered, Judas Maccabeus had faith in the righteousness of his cause, and, using the hilly terrain to his advantage, sprung an ambush on the Seleucid force. Taken by surprise, the soldiers were gripped by fear and fled en masse, pursued by the Maccabees. At the end of the battle, 800 Seleucid troops lay dead, including Seron himself. Now in 165 BC, the seriousness of the situation in Judea was such that it had been raised to Antiochus himself. The king was not going to personally deal with the issue, as he was preoccupied with preparations for his eastern campaign, but left the matter with his appointed regent, Lysias. The regent in turn appointed Ptolemaeus, son of Doromenes, to replace Seron as governor of Kole, Syria, while Nicanor and Gorgias were selected to command a new expedition against the Maccabees. In the meantime, Judas Maccabeus was preparing his own army at Mizpah, near Jerusalem. After a period of prayer and fasting, the men were divided into units and commanders were appointed. Seeking to turn the tables on the Jews and their ambuscades, Gorgias set out under the cover of night with 6,000 men to attack the camp of the Maccabees. However, Maccabeus had been forewarned, so he abandoned his camp 
and took his men from the hills down to the plains. Gorgias, upon finding an empty encampment, assumed that the Maccabees had fled further into the hill country, and so set to work looking for them. At daybreak, the Jewish army came upon the Seleucid camp near the town of Emmaus, which still held a sizable force. The two armies met, with the Maccabees once again putting the Seleucids to flight, and the camp was plundered. According to the first book of Maccabees, 3,000 were slain, while according to the second book, 9,000 were slain. Both figures are looked upon with skepticism by modern historians. In any case, Gorgias finally returned from his search, and upon seeing the smoke billowing from the burning camp, he withdrew from Judea. After yet another military failure, Lysias resolved to end the rebellion through diplomacy. Back and forth negotiations went on between Lysias, Menelaus, and the Maccabees, with the likely intention of the Seleucids being to maintain Menelaus as the head of local government while providing religious concessions, as well as offering a general amnesty, but the rebels were ultimately unwilling to compromise, so the talks fell apart. Thus, in 164 BC, Lysias set out on another expedition into Judea. His army laid siege to the town of Beth Surah, which was aligned with the rebels, as was most of the countryside. Upon learning of this, Judas Maccabeus set off with 10,000 men to break the siege. According to the second book of Maccabees, the Jewish army was led by an angel on horseback, clothed in white and wielding weapons of gold. The two armies met and once again the Seleucids were repulsed, with Lysias withdrawing his men in good order back to Syria. Emboldened by this latest victory, Maccabeus decided that now was the time to retake Jerusalem and expel the Hellenizers. The rebels marched on the city with little resistance coming from the population. Only the Acre, with its remaining Seleucid garrison, resisted, which was invested with a siege. Judas and his men went to the desolated temple, tore down the altar to Zeus, purified the building, and then restored it, replacing the vessels, the curtains, and the doors. In December of 164 BC, the first new sacrifices were carried out on the restored altar, the abomination of desolation finally having been banished. It is said in the Talmud that only a single jar of blessed oil could be found which had not been desecrated, enough only to fuel the menorah for a single day. However, a miracle occurred as the oil burned for a full eight days, after which time new oil had been produced. To this day, the festival of Hanukkah is celebrated by Jewish communities in honor of the rededication of the temple. Thus, by the conclusion of 164 BC, the Maccabees had gained control over Jerusalem and held sway over much of Judea. The eastern provinces had long been a fault line of the Seleucid Empire, with regions breaking away with some regularity. While the East had been largely restored under Antiochus III, much was lost in the aftermath of the Battle of Magnesia, with Seleucus IV subsequently making no attempt to remedy the situation. Now, Antiochus IV sought to follow in the footsteps of his father and restore the East once more. In what had become a standard Seleucid practice by this point, the king had his boy son Antiochus appointed as his co-ruler so that the line of succession would be secure. As mentioned, Lysias was made regent and was given authority over the west of the empire in the king's absence. Antiochus took with him only a relatively small force, nothing close to the vast multitude which had been on display at Daphne, with most of the army left in Syria. The written records of this expedition are scant, and what has survived is lacking in detail. This extends to the precise number of men under Antiochus's command, which makes determining the ultimate extent of his aims in the east somewhat unclear. Was he attempting to subjugate Parthia, Bactria, and march all the way to India, as his father had done, or was he simply making a show of Seleucid power in the region so as to deter any aggression from the east? Whichever it was, the king's first target was Armenia, which had long been a tributary to the Seleucids, up until the defeat at Magnesia. In 165 BC, Antiochus crossed into the Armenian highlands 
and quickly won a decisive victory, routing their army and capturing King Artaxius. The monarch was released, but the status of the Kingdom of Armenia as a dependent of the Empire was reinstated. Antiochus next followed the Tigris down to Seleucia and Babylon, and eventually came to the remains of a port city on the Persian Gulf, where the two rivers join and run into the sea. This town had been founded by Alexander the Great and carried his name, but due to the poor state of the canal system, the place had been inundated and abandoned. Antiochus had the canals repaired and the town resettled, which was now bestowed with the name of Antioch. This became the capital of the local area, hosting a mint, but would still be subject to more flooding over the years, eventually being abandoned in the 9th century AD. The king then travelled around the gulf with his fleet, restoring Seleucid authority over the region, as his father had done, seemingly coming into conflict with some Persians during the process, who were roundly defeated. Sometime during this period, Antiochus also travelled to Ecbatana in Media, which was renamed in his honour, becoming another Epiphania, although this name would later be abandoned. Now, the king came to mimic his father in yet another fashion. Antiochus had heard of a wealthy temple in Elimaeus, dedicated to Nanaia, a goddess of love. This temple was filled with gold, as well as arms and armour, which had been left in offering by Alexander and his men. This inflamed the greed in the king's heart, and he made an attempt to seize the wealth therein. This went only marginally better for Antiochus than it had for his father. With the guards of the sanctuary and the local people working together, to repulse the king's men. A rather tantalizing reference is found in Tacitus, which states that Antiochus's war with the Parthians prevented him from returning to Judea to suppress the Maccabean rebellion, but no other references to this conflict exist. Certainly we know from Polybius and Porphyrius that by late 164 BC, the king had marched as far east as Gabai, modern Isfahan, in what was now the very east of the empire. So it is certainly possible that some sort of conflict with the Parthians was either planned or did take place on a limited scale. However, no great campaign would take place, as it was at this time that Antiochus IV Epiphanes suddenly died. The ancient sources are divided as to how this happened. Appian tells us that Antiochus died of a wasting disease. Polybius, Granius Licinianus, and Porphyrius say that the king was driven mad by visions and terrors until he perished. Sulpitius Severus combines these accounts and claims he suffered distress of the mind, followed by bodily disease, which took his life after only a few days. Josephus claims that the king had a build-up of anxiety, which turned into a lingering and ultimately fatal illness. The first book of Maccabees states that he fell ill from grief, over his earlier actions in Jerusalem, and then died. The second book of Maccabees provides the most detailed and colourful account of the king's demise. While in the east, word came to Antiochus of the defeat of his generals by Judas Maccabeus. Enraged, the king vowed to turn Jerusalem into a cemetery, abandoning his eastern plans and immediately setting off west on a chariot. The God of Israel then inflicted him with severe intestinal pains, but this only made Antiochus angrier, and he ordered his charioteer to speed up. Soon after the king fell from his hurtling chariot, his body breaking as he hit the ground. His flesh then began to rot away, while worms came out of the ground and began devouring the still living king, with the smell of his putrefying body being intolerable to his men. Antiochus repented of all he had done to the Jews, and then died. Modern historians have suggested several diseases which could have caused the death of the king, such as epilepsy, but ultimately all we know for sure is that the king died in November 164 BC while he was in the east. He was approximately 50 years of age and had reigned for 11 years. Before his death, Antiochus summoned Philip, one of his companions, and bestowed upon him his diadem and royal insignia to take back to his son Antiochus. 
Philip took this responsibility as an appointment to be the new regent over Lysias and set off west to secure power. According to one account, while the body of Antiochus IV was being conveyed back to Syria for burial, the draft animals became spooked while crossing a bridge and flung the corpse into the river, where it was washed away, a final insult from the gods to the sacrilegious king. In many ways, Antiochus IV Epiphanes was a monarch at peak performance. He had accomplished more in his 11 years than many other kings had achieved in much longer reigns. He seized the Seleucid throne and established his own power in so quick a fashion that no neighboring states were able to take immediate advantage of the empire's instability. He was then able to not only defend his realm from a Ptolemaic invasion, but to utterly defeat Egypt to an extent which no prior Seleucid ruler had. The coffers of the royal treasury were restored, and much of the empire experienced an economic upturn. Many civic and religious construction projects were undertaken and completed within and without the empire, most notably the construction of an impressive new quarter for Antioch. Where his predecessor had ignored the east, Antiochus once again made a show of Seleucid strength in the region, restoring Armenia and parts of the Persian Gulf to the empire. Vitally, all of these things were done without alienating the Roman Republic and, in fact, maintaining the closest relationship with Rome of any Seleucid ruler to this point. Under Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the prestige of the Seleucid Empire was restored in the eyes of the Greek world, once again becoming a power to be feared and respected. However, as much as Antiochus accomplished such things, his reign also showcased a number of failings. While Egypt had been militarily defeated, Due to Roman interference, Antiochus was unable to annex any new territory into the empire. Given that the peace treaty negotiated with the Ptolemaic siblings became null and void upon the death of Antiochus, Egypt remained a threat for future Seleucid rulers. Judea was left in a state of revolt against the empire, which, while it may not have been the result of some sort of particular hatred of the king towards the Jews, speaks to the greed of his taxation policy and his lack of tact when dealing with non-Hellenic cultures. Most of all, Antiochus died during the prime of his reign, leaving an active military campaign in the east unfinished and a child once more on the throne to be fought over by other power brokers. Moreover, with his nephew Demetrius still alive, there now existed two competing branches for the Seleucid throne. The line of Seleucus IV and the line of Antiochus IV, which would leave the reign of any future ruler subject to dynastic challenge. Had Antiochus not perished prematurely, instead continuing on to achieve more of his goals, stabilizing the empire and allowing his heir to reach the age of majority, he would surely have been considered one of the greatest Seleucid monarchs. Instead, to most of those who have heard of him in the modern age, he is known as an oppressive tyrant. Construction work on the Temple of the Olympian Zeus in Athens, which Antiochus had restarted, came to an end shortly after his death, the project being abandoned due to lack of funding. It would not be until another three centuries had passed that the building would finally be completed, under the auspices of the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Next time, yet another power struggle will play out in Syria, while the Maccabees continue their revolt in Judea. If you have any comments, criticism, or questions, please post them below, and thank you for listening.